Dana and thank you to Nancy and Writers Guild uh, for hosting this. I'm really thrilled to be here and thank you all for coming. I hope this will be a valuable couple of hours that uh, I love to get a chance to spend with fellow writers and colleagues. Uh, the, the story she alluded to, I was thinking, do I have any good revision stories of my own? It's actually kind of an anti-revision story, which was one of the highlights of my uh, writing life because I wrote this movie that featured Peter O'Toole. And it was a Christmas movie, and um, and we sent off the script on a sort of, it was like a low-budget film. I couldn't believe he was actually going to do it, but his, his, his agent said, yes, he'll do the movie. It was great. And it was all moving very, very rapidly into production. So I wrote a draft, and I, I sent him the script, and then there were some production rewrites over the next couple of months. Nothing major, but the inevitable kind of production rewrites. And then a week before shooting, uh, the director and I get this email from Peter, whom we had never communicated with directly, it had all been through his agent. And his email said, the script you sent me initially is the one that I fell in love with and is the one I have committed to memory. It is the one I will perform. <laughs> so I said, okay. And um, so then the, so it was like this anti-revision story where I then had to kind of, he was in like 16, so I had to reverse engineer these six scenes, so they were exactly, you know, as written originally, and, you know, sort of put other things around them. Um, but I just realized my one best or my, my most treasured re revision story is actually kind of an anti-revision story, which was very fortunate for me. Um, so I just wanted to start. So over the next two, two hours, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to get a chance to talk about a very pragmatic approach to revision, kind of strategy that hopefully will be of some use to people. Um, we will then get a chance to do a, an exercise that is, you'll see the script in front of you, you don't have to pay any attention to it right now, that will, so everybody will be a hands-on thing. So we get to, to sort of get our, our hands into some revision, and I think hopefully that'll be fun for everybody. Um, I wanted to start with just a moment about my own personal where I come from in terms of the philosophy of writing in general, which might sort of um, have some bearing on how you choose to listen to what I say or choose to ignore it as you wish. Um, I personally think that we as writers, what we do is enormously important, especially right now. I look at our mission as writers to help erase the margins between each other. That when we write authentic characters and infuse them with humanity, that that can create empathy in an audience member that sees those depictions of humanity, that sees the other, and perhaps it is not so much the other anymore, but rather it helps to erase the margins between us. And I think now, more than ever, this, this personal mission of mine is really important. So it's something that I firmly believe in, and I think all of the work we do here is really, really significant. And obviously, a, a huge part of that work is be writing and how we approach revision. So um, I wanted to start with uh, a general thought about how do you approach revision and why do I like revising? I like revising Peter O'Toole's O'Toole story aside because I think it, it demands that we ask some of those basic questions that we as writers always grapple with. Who are we? Where are we going? Where have we come from? Why are we here? I, I really feel that when you look at a script after you've written it and try to revise it, these very, very basic fundamental questions of writing and life come to the surface. And I, I wanted to start with this one theater game that I do, which illustrates to me better than I can explain uh, verbally the one thing I really do know about writing. And very graciously, we have, oh, Kamora, wait, did Kamora duck out? Oh, there she is, okay. Um, some, of the, some of the folks from the LIU TV Writer Studio, Kamora is actually the assistant director of the uh, TV Writer Studio, have graciously agreed to help me with this game, which is a theater game called Red Light, Green Light. So Raymond and, 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 and Ruth and Kamora are going to come up here and help me out for a little bit. So here's, here's the deal. Um, Red Light, Green Light is, is just a theater game. Um, and it is that childhood game that anybody play? Anybody ever played Red Light Green Light as a kid? So, so you may remember the idea of Red Light Green Light. Here's the rules. We we'll review the rules for our yeah, yeah, three kids. We review, we'll review the rules. So there is an it, and this is going to be a very challenging Red Light Green Light experience because it's going to be navigating things that we hope we don't break on route. Um, it stands over here. 
and it turns his or her back, says red light, green light, one, two, three, and then turns. The people who are trying to, or contestants, it's called contestants, try to advance on it, and then they freeze, because if it turns and sees anybody moving, it can send that person back to the, to the starting line. So the contestants are trying to get that to be that first person to touch it, to get to win the game and become it. The contestants, if they are caught moving, get the, the, the queen or king gets to send them back to the starting line. So is that clear? Clear? <laughs> Poor me. Uh, uh, all right, so not it. Yeah. You're it. Okay. All right. She's, she's, she wants to be it. I was going to do the whole not it thing. But, uh, all right. I'm going to step out of line. So we're, so we're clear. So Kamora is yeah, going to... Yeah. I did red light, green light, right? Yep. She's okay. going to turn around, say red light, green light. One, two, three. They're going to try to advance and we'll see who wins. Okay. I'll step out of the way. You've done this before. You sneak. I know this. You're right. <laughs> red light, green light. One, two, three. Well, you know, there's only two of them, so I'll, I'm going to be nice. All right. Red light, green light, one, two, three. Red light. <laughs> Red light, green light, one, two, three. Red light, green light, one, two, three. Red light, green light. Red light. Red light, green light, one, two, three. Red light, green light, one, two, three. Red light, green light. One, two, three. Oh, wow. 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 Red light, green light, one, two, okay, I can't look at that. Red light, green light, one, two, three. 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 up here and, and what was her relationship to her subjects to these two contestants what did that what, did, what how was she how did she treat them was she benevolent was she stern was she yeah yeah she had no interest in seeing them succeed yes she had absolutely no interest in seeing them succeed this was talk about a one percenter <laughs> this is yeah and what about what about our two our two contestants what what, what about Ruth? What did we see about, what, how would you describe her character? If we were watching a play, what, what was her character? Ernest. Ernest. Very earnest. Who was, who was it say? Yeah, the earnest was like, absolutely, she was so earnest. And, so, and, and by the way, it was almost like, did I see this right? There was like self-policing. It was like that sort of heartbreaking, it was sort of heartbreaking moment for me where she said, no, are you, she didn't have to say anything. She said, no, you got me, and just and went back. And what, what about Raymond? What, how would we describe his character? He was, he was there's a bit of the assassin. He, he was like, you know, there's this sort of stealth assassin that came out a little bit. And then he had this run where he, you know, where he was going to make his move. But then he just sort of, I'm going to lay back. So, so the, the point of this whole exercise, as for us as writers, is... When a character wants something, 
and meets an obstacle, behavior oozes out of that individual. Behavior is revealed. And that's the only thing I really know about writing, I think, is that your hero has to want something. And these, you know, these, they weren't trying to be characters. She wanted to win. I mean, Kamora wanted to win. She wanted to continue being that ruler. These people wanted to become the ruler, so they had wants. And there's an obstacle. And when somebody wants something, and they meet an obstacle, they, human behavior oozes out of them. And that's what an audience likes to see. So that's the one biggest piece of advice I might have um, in writing in general, but certainly as we look at revision, this is the one thing I really believe in, is your hero needs to want something. And this is like, it's such a, it's one of these things that, that everybody knows and everybody sort of inherently says, oh yeah, you're just stating the obvious, but it's really easy sometimes to forget. You get wrapped up in the complexity of a story and you forget sometimes. This is what I like about revision, as I say, is that it kind of draws upon, it draws you back to some very basic questions. Um, so, uh, so let's see. So, um, when we have a script, first of all, I want, I want to sort of say to everybody here, you know, I think what we do is incredibly difficult as TV writers, as screenwriters, as people who write, who write screenplays, because it is a hybrid form. It is not a novel. It is, it is a blueprint for production, but it's also more than that because it's, right, it's our sales tools. It's the thing that we give to people to read, and hopefully they will read it in that same engrossing way that you read a novel. There's this great piece of 1970s kind of uh, literature rant by John Gardner called uh, Moral Fiction, and he describes the experience of sitting and reading a novel. And when you get fully engrossed in that novel, it's like you've entered the world of the novel fully, right? And you're in this vivid and continuous dream that is the world of the novel. And anything that bumps you from that vivid and continuous dream is bad writing. Now, as screenwriters, we have this doubly difficult task because our script hopefully engrosses people in the same level as that novel does, the vivid and continuous dream you enter into that world of the screenplay, but it also has to serve as this blueprint for production, right? It's like, this is what you're going to shoot. So I just want to sort of applaud everybody here and acknowledge that what we do is really, really difficult because we're, we're serving two masters simultaneously. And hopefully that's something that um, we can all do successfully and revision is an essential part of doing that successfully. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to start out with just this part of the, of the evening. It's just very, very pragmatic, right? This is just, you have written that script, and you've finished it, and it's like, oh, okay, it's done. Now I want to revise it. So I'm going to just suggest, again, it may feel like stating the obvious, but here's some pragmatic steps and an approach. This is like an approach to, all right, so how do you revise? What's the strategy? Because sometimes, you know, we... We don't consciously have a strategy about revision. And this is just offering some ideas about, all right, here's a strategy. Here's maybe just like some concrete steps you can take. First of all is just put it away. Uh, and honest to God, as we all know, like if you just put it in a drawer for a week, it, well, for, don't open up your laptop for a week and try to read it. It will clear your head immensely. Now, in TV, oftentimes you don't have the luxury of doing that. You know, you've got to just roll right into production, or you've got a, a rewrite that's due the next day. But if it's at all possible to clear your head on any level, just very pragmatically, put it away long enough to clear your head. Now, I am, this is a generational thing, I suspect, I'm a big advocate of then printing out the script so you can read it on paper. And I realize that part of that may just be a generational thing, that I'm more comfortable reading things on paper. But I actually do think it makes a difference. I think you read a script in a different way when you have it, when you actually have physical pages. So my suggestion is print it out, and then, then we go, my suggestion is we go from macro to micro. So you start with, okay, I'm going to just start with the biggest picture of this script. And my strong, strong suggestion is step one, Put it away for a week, you have a hard copy, read it all the way through. Resist the urge 
just stop and make a little note and say, oh, this doesn't work, or to, you know, note all of, don't be the editor yet. Don't be the editor yet. Give yourself a chance to just read through the whole thing. And the reason I suggest that is because then I think you'll be better poised to ask yourself a few of these really big major questions that should be the first macro issues you address as you approach revision. And I would say the, the very first thing you should ask yourself, you read the whole script, you, you set it down and you say, okay, what is this story about? Again, sounds like an incredibly simple, basic question, but oftentimes when you get into the intricacies of writing a whole script, you tend to forget, what, what is this story about? My friend Valerie Woods, who's the co-executive producer of Queen Sugar, she always says when she writes a TV pilot, she, um, she always asks herself these three questions. Um, what is the story about? Which really to her is theme. So it may seem like you know, the genre, it's not genre, it's like, is this story about what happens when someone pursues revenge to the point where he becomes uh, unbalanced? You know, it's like, think about a theme as an active action statement of what is this story really about? Um, two, what do, you, what do you have to say about that? So, in other words, um, if you're looking at Breaking Bad, you say, oh, this is a story of a man who says to himself he's doing a good thing for his family, but he's actually, in the end, doing it because he feels powerless and is trying to gain power. What do you have to say about that, that issue? Because if you don't have anything to say about it, then it's fine you're telling a story, but that's the differentiation between soap opera and drama. Soap opera is stories told, which may be engaging, but there's not really a theme, and certainly there's not an authorial voice that says, here's what I think about this story. Now, soap opera is all story and no theme. So it's very important to me. It's like uh, I suggest to all of us as writers. What do we have to say about that? And then thirdly, which is always the interesting question, why should anyone else care? And so that's always a good one. It's like, yes, I have this story. I think I know what the theme of this story is. Three, why should anyone else care? And I would argue that um, generally it's because of character. You know, I certainly, as I bet all of us in this room would say, that character is primary. Character is story. It is character that pulls us through when we think of movies, we tend to think of the characters first. Yes, there are movies that are very story heavy and very plot driven, but still without a character to follow through on this adventure, you're really left high and dry. So um, the, um, the wonderful writer, Billy Ray, I don't know if anybody knows Billy, he's this great screenwriter. He did Captain Phillips and a bunch of great movies. He says that whenever he starts a screenplay, he tapes up on his laptop, what is the simple emotional journey of my hero? And that's what I would suggest that as we ask ourselves these big basic questions as we look at a revision, put that down. What is the simple emotional journey of my hero? Again, I, all of these things are so sort of like basic and simple, but we all know as writers, oftentimes this is what revision can do for us, is you lose track of these very elemental basic questions that you start out with. You start out with, oh, I want to tell this story because this happened to me and, and it was unjust and, and my, my best friend, you know, is this really interesting character. And then you get way down the line and you forget, what is the simple emotional journey of the hero? What is the mask that we see a hero wear at the beginning of the film that gets dissolved by the end of the film? The beginning of Erin Brockovich. Erin Brockovich is there. She's, we see the mask of this woman. We see this woman who's insecure, who uh, places this primary value on her physical presentation, on her ability to flirt with men. By the end of the movie, that mask has been taken away, and Erin Brockovich <coughs> is this powerful, authentic person who she really is. And the, again, the audience 
loves to follow that simple emotional journey of somebody who changes. This is the other, um, by the way, the other, uh, one of those other big picture questions you can ask yourself is, does my hero change? Over the course of this film or this TV, TV is slightly different if you're writing a series because, as we all know, the TV show has a different mission. But let's just say for the moment we're writing a screenplay. Does my hero change? Does my hero change enough? So, um, so I, I, I jumped ahead just a little bit because um, I, I want to stay, pictured on the, stay focused on the big picture questions that you're going to ask yourself before we move into character a little bit. Um, and one of the, and the, the question I, I jumped over was a question I often ask myself. I also write for the theater. And this seems to be a question that people, um, oftentimes theater dramaturgs will ask this question. I never, I don't hear it so much in writer's rooms, but I think it's a really good question. It's, at the end of this piece, what do I want my audience to feel? What do I want my audience to feel when they are through watching this? And I think that's a really good thing to ask yourself um, because you, it helps inform genre and tone that you are trying to achieve. Um, so we're still on big picture macro issues to ask yourself. Um, you've asked yourself about the big picture of the story you're telling. Why am I telling the story? Now we talked about, we started talking about character. You know, does my hero go on a simple emotional journey? Do I have the right main character? You'd be surprised oftentimes that you work through a whole piece and you read the script and you go, is this actually the right main character? Is there another character who is actually more active? Usually the question comes down to, is my hero active enough? Is my hero the energizing, active hero who pushes things forward. Because um, oftentimes the trap is that you, you know, as, as human beings, we experience life as, oh, it happens to us. I was walking down the street and this car hit me. You know, just shit happens to us. But the difference is that for writing scripts, the hero has to be active. You know, we all know this. It's like you, but sometimes you, you don't realize this when you get in the heat of doing the a script, you forget, oh yeah, is my hero really pushing the action forward? So, is my hero pushing the action forward? And two, do I have the right hero? Maybe I don't have the right hero. Um, so, another motto, I can't remember who said this first, but I really like it, is in terms of looking at that hero, looking at, do I have the right hero? Is this the right what path to follow down? Your goal is to create somebody that you love and that the audience loves, and put that person through hell. This is our job as writers. So we create a character that the audience loves, now put that character through hell. And so that's another basic question to ask yourself. Have I put my character through enough hell? Could I have made things more difficult? Um, oftentimes you look at a script and go, actually, you know what, I took it, that hero got an easy way out. There's something more difficult that that hero could do. Um, then, speaking of characters, do you have a strong antagonist? Um, oftentimes, we spend a lot of time thinking about our protagonist, and that character is fully developed, and there's uh, depths, and it's a rounded character. But your antagonist, it, it, generally, your protagonist is only as strong as your antagonist. You know, it's like, it's only as good as Darth Vader. Um, you know, when you have an, a really powerful antagonist, that oftentimes is the difference between really a successful story and an unsuccessful. So look at the antagonist. When you're looking at the characters, look at the antagonist. Um, and then I would also suggest look at the supporting characters and can they be more interesting? I, um, I often have found that, anybody here, I think I'm the, Last person is a huge fan of Preston Sturgis. People know Preston Sturgis? All right, I have to recommend. Thank you. Uh, you've got to watch. You've got to go home and, 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 and pull up Preston Sturgis movies, particularly Sullivan's Travels. 
Preston Sturgis, who was a writer-director, one of the first in the 40s in the Hollywood studio system. Sullivan's Travels, uh, The Lady Eve, these great Preston Sturgis movies, his, as he said, he would give the 11th character of the scene the punchline to the scene. He filled his world with each character, was very distinct, which means each character had a distinct vocabulary had a distinct attitude about what the event of the scene, what was going on in that scene, what was the event of the scene, and what was, my, what was that character's, that minor supporting character's attitude toward what you were seeing in the scene. So oftentimes, like I think revision can be enormously helped by just looking at the supporting characters. Can you make them more interesting? Can they be less predictable? Can they be more fully rounded? Um, then, so we're still looking big picture, we're looking still at, at big picture, but we can start to break it down a little bit. If we are talking about screenplay, or even if we're talking about a TV script, you know, do you really have, I know you probably mapped it out this way when you outlined, but do you really have three acts that you feel are strong? Do you have that, you know, something that happens at the end of Act 1 that truly propels your hero in a new direction? Not that this happens, has to happen all the time, but oftentimes at the beginning of Act 2, does your hero launch on some sort of journey, whether it's an emotional journey or the physical journey of Dorothy setting off on the yellow brick road? That can be a very helpful thing to consider. And then at the end of Act 2, is there some dark night of the soul, whatever that might mean to the particular nature of your script? Uh, I, again, I'm not someone I, I, I'll... You know, as we all know from being working writers, that that your, you know, God forbid, serves sort of any adherence to formula, but these general notions can help you look at a script and go, could it be stronger if actually more bad shit happened at the end of Act Two? Could it be stronger if the character actually did have this turning point at the end of Act One and was propelled in this new direction? Um, Again, I'm not advocating any kind of formulaic approach to writing, just that those kind of questions can help you look at a script and see if it can be made stronger as you revise. Um, and then, is there, a, is there a satisfying conclusion? And as we all know, satisfying doesn't necessarily mean happy, nor does it mean tragic. There's this whole study, a psychological study done of audiences and their relationship to watching film and watching drama that revealed that what audiences value most is the effort the hero makes. It's not whether the hero succeeds or fails. You know, Rocky loses the fight, but he, it was the effort that engages us, and it was the fact that he lasted 15 rounds that moves us. Um, so conclusions... And by the way, the conclusion, the last shot, should, should, no shoulds, but often, is the two most important people in the movie. The end of Rocky, it's Rocky and Adrian. That's what the movie's emotional heart really is. At the heart, it's a love story between those two. So look at the very last thing you have in your script. Is it the satisfying conclusion that brings together those two people that really are at the heart of your movie? So, all right, so now, so that's big, big picture, big, big picture of things to ask yourself as you, as you revise. Now let's move to sort of, if you will, sort of narrow the focus. It's like we're on the Google map, and now we're going to zoom in to Tribeca. We've been looking at New York City, now we're going to zoom into Tribeca. And let's just look at C. So now we're going to sort of, we've asked ourselves these big questions about the totality of the script. Now we're going to look at individual scenes. And let's just take each individual scene and just ask yourself, does it actually have a beginning, middle, and end? I'm not talking about like the eight-page scene of the guy crosses the street, but you know, the actual body of scenes in your in your script. Does this scene actually have a beginning, middle, and end? And that old adage, which I think is really true, you know, a character should never leave a scene by the same door in which she entered it which isn't physical, it's emotional, you know, that something happens in each scene that affects your character, that affects the, the, the hero of that one scene. So, um, 
going from this big, big picture, like say the Google map of Manhattan, to zooming in on Tribeca, which are your individual scenes, look at each scene and say, can it be structured differently? Does it actually have a beginning, middle, and end? And this, all, this is actually a really easy thing to do, but sometimes it's like it's such a simple thing to do. Look at where you place the scene. Is there a more interesting place to locate the scene? Like you say, oh, well, it's a family discussion, so they're sitting around the dinner table. Okay, that represents life as we know it, but is there a more interesting place that the family discussion could take place? On a roller coaster, I don't know. You know, like going to the beach. Um, you know, it's, it's like oftentimes we will default to understandably our own lived experience of no oh, family discussion, what happens in the kitchen. Um, nothing wrong with that, but oftentimes if you think through, is there actually a more interesting place this could take place, you'll end up with a stronger, fresher, brighter scene. Um, within each scene, um, going back to red light, green light, again, it's like, it's so easy to just kind of lose track of this as you write individual scenes. What does the character want in each scene? Each scene, the characters want something, and they meet obstacles, and they either win or lose. You know, it's like, the thing about a scene is that like a character wants something, and that character is going to leave the scene having either gotten what she wanted or not. And, I mean, sometimes you could call it a draw, but then you might look at that scene and go, well, is this a, does this scene actually move the story forward? Um, so it's really important to just look at each scene and say, what do my characters want in each of these scenes? Really important question. Um, okay, now let's sort of you know, zoom in further from Tribeca to, what is this, 250 Hudson. Um, and let's start looking at dialogue. So dialogue within the scene. Um, first question to ask yourself is, is there too much dialogue? Is it possible, and you know that old adage, like almost all that you can cut into a scene, deeper into the scene, you can get out earlier. Um, and is there a way you can tell this scene visually? Um, Coming from the theater, I love dialogue. There's, you heard me say, like Preston Sturgis, you know, there's nothing better than Preston Sturgis' dialogue. But nonetheless, uh, we you know, live and work in a visual medium. So is there a way to tell this visually rather than through dialogue? One of my first experiences out in Hollywood was writing for a show where there was a scene on a dance floor, and it was this young couple falling in love. And coming from the theater, you know, I wrote this dialogue scene, and then one of my fellow writers said, you know what, actually, and he showed me that you just have them move, they start dancing formally, they look into each other's eyes, they get closer, the dance becomes more and more intimate. You can tell that whole story visually, and it's a stronger storytelling for this, for this medium, really. Um, in terms of dialogue, something I mentioned earlier, does each character, each character should have, because we all do as human beings, we have a very specific vocabulary. Um, you know, look at the vocabulary choices you've made for your characters. Do they all talk the same? You really don't want to be Aaron Sorkin, right? Where everybody talks exactly like Aaron Sorkin. Um, I know he's a great writer, but you know, nothing against him. But I, you know, he gets away with it because he's sort of super brilliant at it, but really, human beings each have their own vocabulary. They grew up in different places. Even, you know, you, you know New Yorkers know this, like to, to meet somebody who grew up on the Lower East Side as opposed to the Upper West Side, there's going to be a different speech pattern. There's going to be different vocabulary choices. You know, your environment you grew up in, educational level matters. Um, you know, the, everything about human beings dictates different choices of vocabulary. And so really look at how, um, how your characters talk. Um, then, and this is, I think, a very forgotten, it's kind of a trick, but I think it's a really good, valuable trick, is action lines. Action lines are the bane of most scripts. <clears throat> I know when I first got to LA, this was in the early 90s, there was this mode 
at that moment in screenwriting of the kind of one word action line. No. He kicks, boom, she falls, ouch. Just like, to me, and, and coming from, well, anyway, I, you know, it, really just, it drove me crazy. I was just like, this is such bad writing. How can anybody do this? And it, it was both a phase, but it also indicated to me something that action lines are your chance, weirdly enough, to have your voice heard by the reader. I often think of action lines as imagining you're whispering the story to somebody's ear. It's your voice. It should be clear. Clarity is everything. For the obvious reasons that people are also going to be shooting this and they want to know exactly what they're shooting. But um, it also is a chance to interject humor. Like I, I've referred a couple of times to the Breaking Bad pilots, like everybody knows that are easily accessible online. Very funny. The action lines are really funny. And um, it's a way to interject humor and it's a way to get your voice as opposed to the voices of your characters. When people say, what's a writer's voice? Well, yes, it is the world you create. It's the kind of characters that you move through that world. It's also, in, the, in our case, it's your action lines. Action lines can be funny, they can be specific, they can be quirky, they can represent you. So it's, that's kind of a, a trick, um, but I think a legitimate trick, and, and one that actually works for a lot of people. Um, uh, lastly, when do you know when you're done? This is a really, really hard question. The 19th century painter John Singer Sargent said it takes two people to paint a picture. One to paint it, and a second to tell him when he's done. And so it, there is this element of, I've seen this happen with people, where they, they work something to death. You know, it was better three drafts to go. Um, and so this is a very difficult thing to, this is where I would say, seek the help of your friends. You know, people, at some point you want to have friends, treasured friends reading this to give you legitimate feedback. But um, one of the hardest things to know is when it's done. And, and also, P.S., you, you, um, because you read these stories, like I mentioned Aaron Brockovich. Um, a friend of mine knows Susanna Grant, and Susanna Grant said, oh yeah, that opening scene in Aaron Brockovich happened very, very late, and P.S., I wrote 120 drafts of that script. This part of me goes, mm, really? I, you know, I, I'm a little skeptical of that. But the truth of the matter is that, that each person here will have his or her own way of approaching writing, and frankly, oftentimes, like, that second or third draft is really close. It's really it. You know, like I, I just encourage. I know some, sometimes people hear these these tales about you know 120 drafts. Well, it's not going to be any good unless I do 120 drafts. And I'm just here to tell you that, especially working in television, you don't always have time to do 120 drafts. You could count production revisions as drafts, and you do. But it's like oftentimes, you know, trust your instinct. Two, don't you know, shortchange yourself by thinking, I have to do 100 drafts or it's not going to be good. Um, that's just my, my thought about that. <laughs>